Hey, well, welcome everyone. This is Liza Greenberg with the Visiting Nurse Association of America. We're really pleased that everyone could be on our webinar today, Coordinated Care for Joint Replacement. Um, it's a particularly timely webinar as the new CMS regs came out yesterday. Um, and let's see. Um, our agenda today will include both a discussion of the policy as well as some of the tools that VNAA has developed for members. And um, first up, we'll have Molly Smith, who is VNAA's Vice President of Policy and Innovation, who will discuss uh, VNAA's uh, toolkit, e-toolkit, which will assist members in implementing value-based purchasing programs. But before that, she'll go over the new policy regs for the Coordinated Care for, for Comprehensive Care for Joint Replacement Program. And after Molly, um, I will talk about VNAA's new Blueprint for Excellence toolkit which has information on working with patients after discharge from joint replacement surgery. And I did want to let members know that this call is recorded. We uh, will be holding questions till the end of the presentations, and then we'll take questions from everyone. Um, we ask that you mute your lines uh, if you're not speaking, and if you um, want to unmute yourself to ask a question, that's fine, or you can send it in via the chat uh, uh, icon at the bottom of your screen. So thanks, everyone, and we look forward to the call. Great. Thank you so much. Um, so just move over and get started. So as Liza mentioned, uh, yesterday CMS did put out the final regulation for the Comprehensive Care for Joint Replacement Program. Um, we have previously referred to this program as CCJR. CMS uh, refers to it as CJR. Um, and sometimes I wrote on the slide, coordinated care for joint replacement. Um, so the program has a number of names, but I think if you get a C, a J, and an R, um, we'll all be good. So uh, the slide that we're looking at right now is uh, just uh, the high points of the program. Um, and then we'll dive in a little bit deeper to some of the other pieces to it and try to point out why this program is so relevant for home health and hospice uh, providers. So to begin with, uh, this program does implement a mandatory bundled payment program for hospitals in 67 metropolitan statistical areas, or MSAs. You'll note that if you were familiar with the proposed rule, this is a reduction in the number of MSAs that are included in the program. CMS had previously proposed to include uh, 75, so they've taken several, uh, several out. Um, this program would apply to joint replacements um, with and without major complications, and we'll get into sort of the details of that a little bit later. Uh, beneficiaries would be automatically enrolled. They would not have the option to sort of opt out of this program. And the real goal of the program is to test whether bundled payments um, for these procedures and uh, follow-up care um, can improve the quality of care while reducing costs to the Medicare program. And CMS has finalized the program with five performance periods uh, beginning on April 1st of, of this coming year, so April 1st, 2016, and ending December 31st, 2020. You'll also note that this is a three-month delay from the initial proposal. Uh, so the performance periods, uh, the first one will be nine months, so that April 1st through December 31st of 2016, and then each of the four remaining performance periods operate for one calendar year. In terms of who this program applies to, so this is a hospital-focused sort of or centric program, and it applies to all um, inpatient prospective payment system hospitals in uh, the selected MSAs. And of course, by uh, singling out the IPPS or identifying our, uh, the IPPS hospitals, what um, CMS is doing is excluding hospitals that are paid on a different basis, such as critical access hospitals, which are ba uh, paid on a cost basis. There are some other exclusions from the program. Um, the state of Maryland, all hospitals, because they are paid under the all-payer model, are not included in this program. And then there are certain times when an episode may not uh, be included in the program. And that the primary instance is when uh, there is overlap with another model that CMS is, uh, is testing right now, the Bundled Payment for Care Improvement, or BPCI uh, program. There could be instances where there's overlap, where a certain um, um, episode of care could be in either the CGAR program or the BPCI program, and CMS um, has clarified in the regulation that BPCI will have precedent. I will note on uh, that one bullet, uh, Model 2 is for acute and post-acute care services, and Model 3 is 
post-acute care only, not acute care only, like it says on that slide. The MSAs, uh, CMS selected them based on a number of criteria. One of them, they looked at the population and they looked at the number of, of uh, knee and hip replacements. Um, they wanted to make sure that they had enough sort of critical mass. They also uh, looked for areas where there was low participation in BPCI, and they did this for a couple of reasons. One is that, of course, they want to encourage more uh, providers to get involved in value-based purchasing models. So it's a, a pretty significant nudge um, for regions where there wasn't high take-up, but also because of this issue of needing um, to have one program take precedence over the other. So, um, so that was one criteria. And then another is high percentage of IPPS hospitals. So um, particularly, you know, if there's a, a region with a lot of rural hospitals or, or cause, um, you know, that would not uh, be so beneficial for the program. So they looked for high regions of IPPS hospitals. CMS, uh, the, the 67 um, MSAs that were selected are listed here on this slide. So I can just, I'll just pause for a moment and you can take a look and see if you, um, if your MSA is located on here. If you need more information, um, such as the MSA number that is available on CMS's website or we're able to help um, you identify that here if you just want to shoot us a note. So I just want to talk a, a little bit about the episode definition. So there are uh, two MSDRGs that can trigger an episode for purposes of this program. The first is MSDRG 469. This is a major joint replacement or reattachment of lower extremity with major complications or comorbidities. And then MSDRG 470, which is major joint replacement or reattachment of lower extremity without major complications or comorbidities. And what happens, an episode is, uh, is triggered when an individual is admitted to an eligible acute care hospital for one of these two conditions. And the episode is going to last for 90 days after the date of discharge from the hospital. The services that are included in the episode are the acute care procedure, so the actual uh, surgery itself, um, the inpatient stay, so all of the, uh, the services to support um, that procedure and stay, and then all related care covered under Medicare Part A and B within 90 days of discharge, and that includes post-acute care and hospice services. If we look at the next slide, uh, CMS uh, clarifies by listing out what they would consider uh, to the, service, the Part A and B services. And again, I want to reiterate that these services are only included in the episode if they are related. And by included in the episode, what I mean by that is that the, the cost of those services to the Medicare program gets, gets included in the target price. Um, it does not mean, and we'll talk about this a little bit more later, it does not mean that all of these services, if they're related to the knee or hip replacement, are, are paid for through the bundle, as in the hospital's paying for these services. CMS does continue to pay directly uh, for these services. These providers continue to bill CMS directly. However, again, it's just the cost of these services to the Medicare program gets wrapped up in, into a target price um, that the hospital is going to be working towards. And again, we'll go through sort of the finance mechanisms and the, and the reimbursement in just a moment. So here's just another way of looking at the episode definition. So you have your acute care stay. You, you will see that I noted the three days pre-admission. This is something that's already wrapped into an IPPS payment for an acute care stay. It's the services that are related to um, the procedure or services that are provided uh, during the acute care stay get wrapped up into that. Then you have a discharge, and then you have a 90-day period afterwards where all uh, Part A and Part B services are included. So this just is a graphic representation of the episode definition. I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the waivers that CMS is allowing uh, for to really facilitate new delivery models, so new ways of providing services uh, that are not currently permitted under the Medicare rules that really are going to allow for hospitals and other providers who are treating patients um, in these models to test different ways of delivering services and, and see what happens, um, preferably, of course, working towards higher quality and lower cost. So the waivers that CMS allowed are the first, and I think is, it will be really interesting for us to discuss here, is the post-discharge home visits of up to nine for non-home health eligible patients. Really, this is for non-homebound um, individuals. 
Uh, so CMS's perspective on this is that if an individual is eligible for home health services, they will um, be admitted and, and begin receiving services uh, you know, from a home health agency. Uh, but if they're not, there may be still some benefit for, some, for getting some um, home visits. I will say under the rules, home health agencies are not allowed to bill for these visits. Um, only a hospital or a physician can bill, and they need to do so um, billing via the physician fee service. That said, CMS has loosened up the rules around oversight. So nurses, for instance, can go and do the visit under general supervision of a, phys of a physician they don't necessarily need to be in direct, um, under direct supervision in the moment. The types of services that CMS contemplates for this benefit are things like care coordination, medication reconciliation, safety or risk assessments, um, assistance with ADLs, um, helping coordinate social services, um, et cetera. Uh, CMS has put a value on this of $50. So um, the hospital or the physician billing um, would get a $50 reimbursement for each visit. And I just want to point out that while home health agencies are not allowed to, prov to bill for these services, it, it may be worth having a conversation with the hospitals in your community about whether you can enter into an arrangement and help deliver these services, um, but again, under an arrangement with either the hospital or the physician group. Um, again, they would need to be the ones that's billing. You would still, if you were, you did that, you would still continue. You would not get paid by CMS. You would get paid by the physician or the hospital. But it's one possible arrangement that could be explored. <clears throat> the next waiver is around uh, telehealth. So as we all know, um, there are a number of limitations on how providers can use telehealth services under the Medicare right, uh, program right now. The waiver, this waiver would waive the geographic requirements um, so that uh, whether you're in an urban or rural setting would not matter. Um, and it would waive the originating site of care so that the home, because so the beneficiaries can be in their homes when receiving um, services via telehealth. The way in which um, this would work is again, um, billing would be through the physician um, fee schedule. Again, home health agencies and hospices are not eligible to bill uh, for these services, but they can be in the home um, concurrently while, uh, while telehealth services are happening to help facilitate the service that's being provided uh, via telehealth. Um, two other quick things. One is that the list of eligible services that's currently approved by Medicare stays the same, so they, they did not add any additional services that um, can be done via telehealth. And when reimbursing um, through the physician fee schedule for this, they will be waiving the facility fee. So um, currently in a telehealth situation, if, for instance, an individual is in a rural, um, or, you know, rural health center and the provider providing the services in maybe their urban academic center, um, that rural health center gets paid a facility fee um, you know, for, for sort of their part on their end of the telehealth. Uh, because the individual is in their home, that fee will not be paid. The final one just to spend a minute on is around the SNF three-day rule. So this is something that CMS has waived in a number of its programs. They're going to waive it in this program for performance years two and five. But I thought something, um, there was something very interesting um, that they did in the final rule that I think may, that we just want to be aware of uh, for potential future implications for us. They're going to waive it, the, the SNF three-day rule, only if, and only in instances where the SNF uh, that the individual is going, that the patient is going to, has an overall rating of three stars or better on the um, nursing home compare in that star ratings program for at least seven of the 12 preceding months. And I think this is really important because as, we're, as we on the home health side got star ratings this year and we sort of wondered what the uh, implications are of having a program such as this, I think this is a big signal from CMS that um, you know, star ratings will be used increasingly in network development and, um, and, and for payment purposes. And the last waiver we don't need to spend much time on, this is just a waiver of Medicare rules that allows CMS to make shared savings payments uh, to the hospitals. So just a, a little bit on the, on the payment model. So the way that the payment model will work is that this is a retrospective bundle payment. Uh, so CMS will establish a target price for the bundle of services. And this target price will change over the life of the model. 
So they're going to start by looking first at the hospital's historic cost over uh, the prior three-year period. But over the five years of the program, they will increasingly look at the cost of services um, for the same bundle of services in the region and not just the hospitals. And the reason why you do this is to really push everyone towards highest efficiencies. Because so for instance, if today a hospital and their referral partners have really high costs, they may not need to do very much to get to start bringing those costs down. And it may, they may look very successful and actually get quite a bit of shared savings, whereas hospitals and their other hospitals and their referral partners who have been extremely lean and efficient um, may not have that ability to drive down costs um, so, um, so significantly. So the idea here is that as you move from a hospital's traditional cost to a regional, that you're really pushing everyone towards um, the highest efficiency. So this is both a protection for efficient providers as well as an additional push on, on high-cost providers. Uh, the target price will um, include a discount. Um, right now it's around 2%. Um, you know, and that, and this is CMS's goal to start driving some minimum uh, amount of savings. So they'll reduce um, that target price by some, um, or the bundle, the, the price of the bundle of services by some, and um, again to drive savings. And then at the end of the year, they'll reconcile the actual costs against the target price um, for all applicable cases. And as we'll talk about in a minute, um, over the life of the program, hospitals will become increasingly uh, responsible for achieving those target prices. So I did just want to take a moment. I know sometimes retrospective bundle payments can be a little bit confusing, and so I just wanted to break it down a little bit more for you. So if you look at this slide, what you've got here is you've got your payer CMS on the left. And I first want to start on the bottom. And so you've got your hospital, physicians, home health providers, um, any kind of drugs, et cetera, like Part D drugs, that um, all of those services that and, and and um, supports that are going to beneficiaries, CMS continues to pay directly for those. So again, as a home health agency, even the hospital is going to continue to get its regular payment. But what happens if you look up at the top is that the CMS enters into a different relationship, in this case with the hospital, where they set a spending target, they set performance standards, and they establish a shared savings and losses program. Um, you know, opportunity. And so that hospital, what their responsibility really is, is to really manage the care for the beneficiary and coordinate across all of the different providers. So again, that hospital takes no financial um, responsibility for paying those individual providers. They just need to coordinate with them. They might do that through sharing data. They may do that through establishing care protocols and pathways, um, et cetera. So this is really how the relationship works. Um, and the target price sort of hangs over the hospital. So the hospital knows it's got this target price it's trying to beat, but it is not holding a pot of money that it is doling out to various providers. Instead, at the end of the year, CMS looks at all the services that were provided that it paid for and says, huh, when I add all of these up, how does it compare against the target price? How did you do hospital in terms of managing that? I will just say one other point is that on this, with all of the clinical protocols, data analytics, um, you know, care management, et cetera, the hospital doesn't necessarily need to do all of those things itself. It can contract, whether it's with other providers or with other um, vendors, to help facilitate all of those things happening. And the last thing I'll mention about this slide is the arrow around shared savings. As we'll talk about in this program, hospitals do have the opportunity to enter in the only financial sort of arrangement they may enter into with other providers is to share savings. Um, so this is a real opportunity for home health agencies and hospices who are really helping hospitals meet their target uh, price to share in some of those savings. All right. On the next slide, um, we'll look a little bit at the risk model. So this is um, ultimately a risk-bearing program for hospitals. In year one, they do not, um, they only have upside risk, which means that they can only get shared savings. They would not get shared losses. In year two, CMS starts to phase in downside risk or shared losses. And then in, in years three, four, and five, a downside risk is in full effect, and hospitals must pay back any excess payments if the target is not achieved. CMS is including um, stop loss and stop gain provisions, and that's to prevent excessive losses for hospitals or excessive payouts of shared savings from CMS's perspective. So if you're not familiar with those terms, essentially what it says is, let's say a target price, I'm just going to make up a number here, is uh, $10,000. 
and a, a hospital comes in at $17,000, I think most people would say a 70% over the initial target price is an excessive amount that a hospital might be expected to pay back. So instead what CMS does with stop loss is say, you know what, um, no, nothing over, let's say, 12000 know, 12, um, We're not going to recoup anything over a certain limit. And that, again, re really protects hospitals from sort of excessive, um, excessive losses. And then, again, they do the same thing on the savings side. Um, so, that's, so that the Medicare program isn't paying out um, what they see as sort of an excessive amount of, of shared savings. So the stop loss and uh, stop gain, those amounts will change over the life of the program and they'll get um, both the opportunity to gain and the risk of, of high losses will increase over the course of the program. Um, in year one, again, it's a gain only and you can gain up to 5%. Um, stop loss, stop gain in year two is at 5%. Uh, and again, stop loss and stop gain is 10% in year three and 20% 20, 20 in, in years four and five. So increasingly um, at risk. Um, I will just mention, I won't go through those numbers again for rural hospitals, but they are different. And CMS has established lower rates of stop loss and stop gain for rural hospitals, including sole community hospitals, um, Medicare dependent hospital and rural referral centers. The last thing I will say about risk is that it's not just about the financial performance. Um, if, a, if a hospital has exceptional financial performance, if they really beat the target price and do well, they could still earn zero shared savings if their quality of care is insufficient. So CMS is establishing thresholds for, um, for performance metrics, uh, for quality of care performance metrics. So looking at that, um, CMS is using two performance measures uh, as part of the CJR model. This is a, a complication measure and a uh, patient experience via the HCAP survey. CMS is also going to seek um, data um, from the hospitals who are participating in the program voluntarily to develop a new measure um, related to patient reported, a, a patient reported outcome measure. So. Um, Unlike the home health value-based purchasing program, if you're familiar with that, which has 21 pl uh, measures plus three measures that they're collecting data to test, this, pro this program has two measures and uh, one measure that they are collecting data to, to test and build. In terms of beneficiary uh, benefits and protections, just a few things to note. One thing is that hospitals are able to use incentives to encourage beneficiary compliance with the plan of care. Uh, CMS does put parameters. Um, whatever the incentives are really do have to be connected to, um, to the item, you know, to the, the beneficiary's medical care. It can't be, for instance, like movie tickets um, or, or financial incentives that really don't um, drive towards um, improved, improved health or compliance with the plan of care. Beneficiaries retain the right to obtain care from any Medicare provider. So even if a hospital in your community um, you know, approaches you and says that they really want to work with you on care pathways, that they really want to encourage their beneficiaries to sort of use you as, as a um, sort of a preferred provider, if you will, if a beneficiary chooses to use another provider, um, they have that, that full right and discretion. Many can't opt out of the program, so if you know if they are going, if they are seeking services from a hospital or or, or within one of these MSAs, um, they are in the program. But hospitals do need to provide them with written information, and CMS will be providing information as well. CMS does expect to save money from this program. In the first year, they expect it to, to cost the money as they get it set up and because they will not be collecting against any of the losses in year one. But increasingly, as uh, CMS is collecting on losses, um, it expects to see savings. So these savings are both a collection of, from losses, but also um, just more efficiency in, in care delivery. So total five-year savings um, or total program savings are expected around $343 million. You may be wondering, there's a lot going on out there right now. Um, we've already talked about BPCI. There's, of course, accountable care organizations. Um, there are other models like the oncology bundle payment model, ESRD bundle payment model, et cetera. Um, so there's a lot of consideration for uh, how does this program sort of fit within all of those other programs. As I already mentioned, the most immediate one with BPCI, um, BPCI models two and three will take precedence over CJR when overlap occurs. 
And CMS is in the process of developing um, mechanisms to not double count savings where other or multiple models are in effect. So we don't really have a great answer here at this point, but it's something that CMS is aware of and working on. The last thing I wanted to focus about in my presentation is um, on what is the role for home health and hospice providers. And I want to um, point out that CMS explicitly encourages hospitals to engage with other providers along the continuum of care. Um, you know, of course, physicians and post-acute care providers to really make sure that they're developing uh, care pathways that, again, improve quality and efficiency. Um, but they also say that you know, they encourage hospitals to, develop, to engage in uh, financial arrangements with these providers as well, because if you're going to be participating in this model and really helping drive performance, um, you, know, you should have the opportunity to share in savings, if there are savings. But also the hospital may be very interested in aligning incentives so that your um, that you are also aware of the risk of financial losses um, should everyone sort of not be not be playing by um, kind of by the the rules that the community wants to set up um, for for care for individuals with these conditions. So um, another opportunity. So this just I, I think again hospitals are going to be looking for partners to to make them successful, and you as you well know offer a lot of value in this space particularly around reducing readmissions, um, at, you know, being a lower cost site of care for many individuals. So um, significant opportunities there. But there is another opportunity. As I mentioned, hospitals have, uh, are going to have to do a lot of work to be successful in a model like this, especially around care coordination and um, you know, patient engagement and education and making sure they understand and comply with the plan of care, et cetera. So hospitals um, may be entering into um, uh, contractual relationships with various organizations to help provide some of that um, infrastructure. And that may be an opportunity, again, for you to uh, work with your hospital as a contract provider where the hospital would pay you, not CMS, but the hospital would pay you for services that you maybe traditionally don't um, provide to them today, um, again, such as care coordination. Other things that they talk about in the rule are things like local network engagement, so really going around and kind of working on behalf of the hospitals to work with other providers to make sure they understand what the program is, um, what the process is, uh, if there are care protocols that they want everyone to get on board with, sort of managing that. Um, managing um, beneficia beneficiary outreach and, um, and again, ed education about the program even prior to um, sort of the care management and coordination function, et cetera. So there's a number of things where you can imagine that you may be able to provide uh, services for, um, to the hospital under a contract relationship. And the last slide is just to be clear, though, CMS has put a number of rules around um, collaboration relationships with hospitals. This primarily is around um, when they are going to enter into gain sharing uh, or shared savings and loss uh, relationships with other providers. Um, I will say that most of this, um, of course, is to protect the beneficiary, to protect the beneficiary from steering, to protect the beneficiary from being directed to places that may not be the highest quality of care solely because there may be a financial incentive involved. Um, but there are but, but there are rules, and should you enter into one of these relationships, you're going to want to be familiar with them. We are happy to walk through them with you in detail. I just highlighted a few here. Um, I did just want to point out that something that we promoted hard in the development of this program was adopted by CMS, and that is that the selection criteria that a hospital uses um, in terms of who it, it enters into these arrangements with must be based on quality of care, um, at least as one of the criteria and cannot be based directly or indirectly on the volume or value of referrals or business otherwise generated by or between the hospital and the potential collaborator. So again, really trying to protect um, that these relationships are, again, going to drive quality um, and not necessarily uh, you know, financial relationships that, that are really solely just based on financial gain. So with that, I uh, will wrap up the uh, comments on the final rule. We're going to go through the rest of the program and leave time at the end for questions. Mm -hmm. um, before I turn it over to Liza, I just want to point you to one resource that's available on the VNAA website. So if you give me just a minute, I will be opening up our, our website. 
So what I've got here, if you go to the, if you're on the main um, VNAA website, you may see that there is a new tab here called Innovate. And if you click on that, that uh, box, you'll come to the toolkit overview. And here is an outline of what's incorporated um, in this toolkit. This is our um, healthcare transformation e-toolkit. You do need to be a member to sign on to the toolkit. And you can see here, we're, we're signing in as Liza. So we're going to sign in for Liza. And you'll get a much more robust table of contents, you'll see here. And we, I just wanted to show you, there's a number of things here. I'm not going to go through them all today because we don't have time. But we have started a page for the coordinated um, care for joint replacement model. We'll change that to comprehensive care for joint replacement model. And if you click on that, um, you'll start to, we're starting to populate this with a number of resources. So the first is um, more information on the program, largely what I went over today. Um, then you'll, you'll be, there's a link to clinical best practices for joint replacements, which I will shortly click on because Liza will be taking you through that. And then the final piece are additional resources, things like access to the final rule, access to our comments on them, access to FAQs and things that CMS puts out. So, um, so for instance, if you click on this, you can get um, you know, more information on the program here. And we will be continually updating this as we get, um, as we get more information. So with that, I'm going to click here for the clinical best practices for joint replacements, and Liza will take it from here. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Molly, and thanks to all of you for being on. Um, this is Liza Greenberg. I'm BNAA's Interim Vice President for Quality and Performance Improvement. And um, I've been working with a work group of members, that many of whom are from your agent agencies, um, clinical quality officers, education folks, rehab folks, to develop the joint replacement material. Um, and we were able to just launch um, our best practice website. And I wanted to briefly walk you through it because it has a lot of the information that can help you develop a program that helps you partner more effectively with hospitals and, of course, meet the quality metrics that uh, derive a lot of reimbursement and, and uh, patient responses to their home health care. So um, actually, I'm going to try to make this a little bit more centered. Um, so you can get to the hip and knee joint replacement web content from our um, main blueprint web page, which is vnaablueprint.org. And um, for those of you who are not familiar with it, we have a lot of really great information on clinical best practices relating to things that are generic, like uh, front loading a visit to very specific information on heart failure, COPD, and now our newest hip and knee joint replacement. They all have the same format. Um, for critical areas that we address, tools and critical interventions, references and resources, training programs, measurement and evaluation. And um, in this overview page, I wanted to point out that more so than maybe some of our other content areas, we've really linked to the policy implications of hip and knee joint replacement. So as Molly noted that her e-toolkit links to the blueprint, we link back to VNA's healthcare transformation e-toolkit here and the Conference of Care for Joint Replacement program from CMS. So there's a lot of really rich links. Um, and you can spend a lot of time on this website or a little bit of time. But um, you'll find that uh, different areas speak to different members of your organization more specifically than others. Let's look briefly at the references and resources section. Um, and I just wanted to highlight this um, for the purpose of pointing out that, again, there's a lot of great links on the website where you can find some um, information that might be useful as a tool. And one example I'll just highlight, for example, is the Mass General PT exercises after hip replacement. Um, very specific patient information with photographs. So we tried to find uh, really the best kind of information that you can offer to patients um, in your program. And I also wanted to point out that while we call this the best practice initiative, it's also evidence-based, that we have references here um, that help to guide the program design. Um, <clears throat> we took what was the best in evidence, we presented it to our work group members, and then we asked them for expert recommendations. So <clears throat> as you know, if you're in the field, there isn't evidence on many of the issues that we address day to day in a home care agency. And so for areas where we didn't have a very specific evidence-based guideline, we did use um, our expert work group to make recommendations. 
So I will go back up and start walking through some of the recommendations that um, members of our work group developed. <clears throat> and this is probably where the meat of our best practice information lies. And you see we broke it out because it's a lot of information. Um, and we decided to start really before the clinical encounter and talk a little bit about what needs to be in a hip and knee management program uh, for a home health agency in today's environment. <clears throat> And I'll just briefly talk about it. You know, obviously, if you are a home health agency and you want to partner with hospitals and, and other payers around a hip and knee program, you want to deliver the best patient care that you possibly can. So the elements of a home health fast track program really talk about what needs to happen for the patient, a patient assessment, a pre-hospitalization assessment, um, planning for post-acute clinical care at home, making sure that you have a coordination plan with the physician and home care team. These are the patient elements, but once you're into a program like a hip and knee replacement program uh, as envisioned by CMS, really you need some other um, parameters in place about how it's going to work. So your hospital partners, for example, are going to want to know what are your pathways, what kind of visit rates are you going to have, who's going to be involved on a clinical perspective, nursing, PT, um, pharmacists, if that's part of the plan. So. Um, you know, this section really talks to you about defining what your clinical program is so that you can communicate with the hospital and your other partners about how you're going to manage this patient effectively. And this is really important communication strategy as you work with those partners to let them know that you can be accountable for helping them achieve their efficiency and patient outcome, um, outcomes. Um, so again, administratively, here's what you need to do. Um, as, as all of you know who are working on five-star ratings, Defining roles and accountabilities is really critical when you're doing your assessments, when you're doing your audits. So again, um, you need to do those same sort of things, but very specifically for the hip and knee joint replacement activities. Um, and quality strategy will be a uh, very important part. I mean, not only are you meeting your own star rating requirements, but you're helping your hospital partners achieve their two metrics that they need to do for a coordinated care for joint replacement. So, making it very specific how you're going to work on the quality metrics and how you're going to report that data back out to your hospital partners. And I wanted to stop here and just say that I um, should have, at the beginning, acknowledged uh, our thanks to Venani, the Visiting Nurse Association of New England, which really kicked off this project for VNAA by uh, sharing with us their clinical pathways for hip and knee joint replacement. So we started with those and moved on to develop um, additional elements to it, but um, Minani really was the, the source of, of this beginning and we were are very appreciative to them. So you can kind of roll up these bars here and go down to the next areas and just for those of you who are considering using this within your agency, each of these bars, for example, could be a lunch and learn or some other way that you can work with your staff. The top one, establishing the program, is maybe something more on the management level, but the rest of them are really for clinicians on uh, what is the clinical pathway for a patient um, coming to you with, after hip and knee joint replacement surgery. So home visit, um, what do you need to know going into it? Um, one of the things that our best practice work group really felt strongly about was that you need to begin the intake process before the patient gets out of the hospital um, so that you need to know uh, a pretty comprehensive set of information before the patient comes to you about the type of surgery, um, any other issues going on with the patient. And then also, uh, after the patient has been discharged, um, very quickly get in touch with the patient and talk to them in a way that will help you assess how quickly you need to get in there and what kinds of other resources you need to bring to bear on that case. Are you going to need CME? Are you going to need, you know, to help them with their pharmaceuticals? Are you going to need, um, you know, other support services if they don't have enough caregiver support? So um, really, uh, having a high-level clinician be in touch with that patient um, has been a, a strategy many of the home agencies have used to, to get on top of the case before you get out into the field and see the patient. Um, and some people are calling these programs fast track. It's becoming almost standard to see two- and three-day discharges in the home care setting. Um, but again, uh, many agencies are finding that if they get ahead of the curve, they can uh, you know, coordinate with a physical therapist who saw the patient in the hospital, and they can even sometimes do visits within the hospital. So a lot of different ways that agencies are trying to make sure that that intake and first visit goes as smoothly as possible. 
Um, start of care visit, this is of course where you're doing all your OASIS assessments, so you've got a pretty busy schedule. Um, and many of these items here are not going to be new to you, but it, this particular page really focuses in on step by step what do you need to do to get um, all of the information you need in place. And just in terms of what's available to you on the blueprint, I wanted to point out that if you click on these links, you can get to other pages. For example, um, this is a whole page we have on risk assessment. Some of this material was developed by my predecessor, Peg Terry, um, so that there's a lot of resources here on the website that can help you. Um, and then, so we'll go on to surgical complications. And this is an area where uh, members have told us that they really put a lot of emphasis at anticoagulation. It's a particularly important issue, um, but one where they see a lot of variability of patients coming out of the hospital. So there are pretty clear guidelines on the medical side about what kinds of anticoagulation therapy patients should be on, but patients aren't always coming out with guideline-based therapy. So as you're interfacing with hospitals on protocols for hip and knee joint replacements and getting aligned with CMS requirements, it might be an area where you talk to your hospital about developing more standardized protocols for discharging patients so that you're getting people who are already on an evidence-based pathway, um, particularly around things like anticoagulation um, and other uh, preventive type strategies. Um, so the key uh, complications you all are going to be looking out for are um, VTE or DVT, uh, skin issues and infections, and you've obviously got um, major infections, which have a critical adverse impact on readmissions and um, costs and patient outcomes, as, as well as the less serious but equally um, disadvantageous for the patient about skin infections. So those are all things that we in home health are looking out for and trying to manage effectively. Um, and then some of the other complications. Um, rehab therapy is obviously a critical component of what we're doing in home care. Um, and one where there are probably not as many evidence-based guidelines as we would like. Um, we have been in touch with the American Physical Therapy Association, and I think they have some guidelines that are actually now proprietary, um, but they're working on developing more protocols and guidelines in response to the CJR program. And so we're staying in touch with them and have links to their website in hopes that there will be more evidence-based practices coming out to help figure out things like, um, you know, the duration of therapy, the intensity of therapy, um, and other aspects of the rehab process. Um, I did want to point out that many organizations are using OTs, um, both for their star ratings activities and particularly around functional status improvement. Um, and our work group has said this has been a very effective strategy for helping them meet performance targets around functional status. Um, so, and you'll see that there are a whole separate set of measures around physical therapy outcomes um, that are listed on this sheet that are not directly ones that you report to CMS, but obviously if you're hitting your physical therapy outcome measures, it's helping you with the functional status measures that we're reporting publicly. And um, we have another area on patient teaching. Again, we link to areas of the blueprint that have already got pretty highly developed content. So for example, we have a very robust medication reconciliation section on the, on the page. So potentially if you're using things in your training program, you can uh, you know, incorporate other aspects of performance metrics and, and uh, home health agency activity like MedRec, which is obviously a critical capability. And tools. Um, you know, one of the things that we decided to focus on in the Blueprint for Excellence is using validated tools that are out there um, publicly in use, but that are also scientifically um, shown to, to um, be effective in terms of assessment. So we've listed a number of the tools that our work group members believe are the, the top tools for specific areas like physical function assessment, functional status, skin integrity, and pain, and obviously being able to assess and effectively address these issues um, in the context of joint replacement um, is very critical and is something that will really help you meet your goals in terms of outcome improvements. So those are the intervention areas and the ones that probably are most relevant to clinical staff. Um, and I just wanted to end up by, well, let me sh first show you our measurement section, which as I mentioned is uh, a component of each of our toolkit modules, so each one of them 
relates to what do you need to be measuring, what do you need to be reporting out um, in this clinical topic area. Um, and you'll see that for joint replacement, there are not specific measures that are publicly reported, but clearly ones like uh, pain, functional status, um, falls, and uh, patient experience are going to be critical to assessing the effectiveness of your program. And I will wrap up by just letting you know what's available to you as you work um, with your own staff. So all of the information that we've seen on the website is actually um, captured in a training PowerPoint that is linked to the website. So you'll see that we have um, a PDF that is um, uh, actually a you know, PDF of a PowerPoint presentation, but will help you walk through everything that was on the website um, having to do with, um, you know, what do we need to do, what are each of the clinical areas, and so you can download that and use it with your own staff. We also have the PowerPoints that I, I briefly referenced, for example, the Medication Reconciliation Program, the Falls Risk Assessment, so all of our training points are available for you to download and use with your own staff members. Um, and if you're not the type of person who likes to click through a website, we also have here a PDF of all of the web contents so that you can just download it and print it off and review it at your leisure. Um, I would say that we're also very happy to present to your staff um, if you are interested in having someone from VNAA present to you or uh, potentially co-present with someone who was on one of our work groups, um, you know, a clinician from your agency, we'd be delighted to do that. Um, and so with that, why don't I... Um, stop here and open it up for questions for uh, both on the policy side and the clinical side. So um, Heather, if you're still with us, if you could unmute the lines, that would be great. And if um, any of you would like to submit your questions or comments by chat function, that's fine too. <laughs> I know who has, I, Friday night after I left here, I'm like, do we have questions? Salad, but I really want a chicken. You know, the I yeah. got a whole chicken. I think it was $12. Oh. It was a big pizza oh. big chicken. Well, really? um, it was not. Um, and Molly, I, we did get a question by the chat button having to do with uh, if we know how 30-day readmissions are going to be captured in the cost evaluations. So actually, readmissions are going to be more than 30 days. Um, hospitals, all readmissions that are related to um, one of those two MSDRGs, so to the original condition, if they occur in the 90-day period, actually are going to be included towards the target price. So they, CMS did remove the quality measure that was specific to readmissions. Um, they had originally proposed to look at, um, at, at readmissions as one of the quality measures. They did choose to remove that. So from the performance sort of uh, metric side, it's not, from the quality performance metric side, it's no longer a part of the program. But on the financial side, uh, readmissions absolutely could count towards the target price. Um, so then we just received another question, and this question was about the slides being available after the meeting. So I just wanted to let folks know there's a couple of ways to um, to reference or to, to get a hold of the material, uh, the content here. The first is through VNAA's learning management system. Uh, this entire session is being recorded, and um, it will be available via the learning management system, which you can access. The second way to access um, a version of these slides, very, very, very similar version, is through the um, that Innovate section of the VNAA website, so where I linked to before, where it, uh, you go to the main page uh, on VNAA, you go to the Innovate tab. You do need to log in. It is a member benefit, and it's open to um, all of VNAA's different types of members, whether a state association, an individual agency, or, or other. You can, you can access it, and if you need a login, please just shoot us a note. Anyway, you'll see there's a section on the, on the comprehensive care for joint replacement. If you click on that, uh, you'll be able to access the slides there. So um, we did get another question about um, anesthesia costs and if those are included. And the answer is yes. So any of the costs that are currently bundled into um, the, the inpatient stay, so if the individual, um, you know, that are that are paid, uh, that are paid for the for the, anything that essentially occurs during the inpatient stay during the acute episode, is included um, in the in the target price. 
Let's see. Um, so I'm just reading our next question. Uh, so it says, I'm a home health agency that is a Model 3 BPCI for uh, these particular, con you know, for DRGs 469 and 470. How does this impact the hospital that discharges a CCJR patient when we are in Model 3? Okay, so this is a situation where your BPCI model would um, take precedence over the CJR. So the hospital in your community, for instance, that takes it, so what's going to happen is that they're going to get this patient, right, and they're going to do the procedure. That is going to trigger the start of the CJR episode. However, when they discharge them to you and you're managing, if you're model three and you're post-acute and you're, so you're managing the, the 90 day post-acute, actually what's going to happen is their episode is going to get canceled. Your episode is going to go forward. So all of the costs associated with that individual, the hospital is no longer responsible for. You under the BPCI model three will have the 90 days post-discharge. Um, so again, just, just to be clear, ho that hospital would not be responsible. That episode would get canceled. It, yes, it technically would get started, but it would get canceled once the individual moves into your BPCI episode. Then we got a question about um, how agencies are using PT-only visits. And um, we do know that a lot of agencies do PT-only visits, um, but that there are some challenges around them that, that agencies are often finding that um, the, some of the assessment questions get answered differently when a PT does them, and some of the issues around medications um, can be challenging because there's a lot of state-by-state -state variation in PT scope of practice. Um, so we did find that a lot of agencies said that they often had to bring in a nurse to a PT-only case, um, but they are still um, offering that as an option. But I think some of them um, bring the nurses in at least to open the case to, to make sure that um, all of the OASIS questions are answered and all the medication issues can be answered appropriately within the scope of practice of each clinician. Um, and those are the questions that we've gotten so far by chat. We'd be happy to answer any other questions. Um, I believe you can dial star one to open your own line. We didn't use the lines because there was a lot of interference. Or you can send us a question by the chat, by the chat button. So, We'll wait just another minute to see if any other questions come in um, and are happy to take any, any of them. Okay, well at this point we, oh wait, here we, I think we do have another one coming in. Okay, so we did get a question about whether face-to-face -face would be required for this program. So I am going to I'm going to explain how I'm interpreting this question, and if I get it wrong, either please um, alert us via the chat or shoot me an email afterwards. So um, of course, the face-to-face -face encounter is required as part of the certification for home health services. That requirement remains in place. So if an individual um, triggers an episode through the CJR program, so they come to the hospital. Um, you know, they're getting a knee replacement, and then at the end of their hospital stay, the decision is to um, discharge them to home health. There would still need to be all of the regular sort of process in terms of determining and certifying whether that individual is eligible for home health, so that they're homebound, that they're, they have a need for skilled services, and that face-to-face, -face, an eligible face-to-face -face encounter occurred and was documented. All of that would still need to happen. Um, so, so this does not change the face-to-face. -face. I will also just mention that in the discussion around the telehealth waivers and provisions, CMS was very clear that the face-to-face -face encounter for purposes of certifying an individual for, for home health um, eligibility cannot be done by a telehealth. So that is um, so that those sort of the two two ways in which I, I can sort of make the link to face-to-face. -to -face. And this is Liza. We had another question come in about use of OTs, and sometimes physician groups are reluctant to refer uh, for OT evaluation. Um, and I can only say that, that um, this is an area that you would want to have pretty specific discussions and negotiations with your referring sources and with the hospital, particularly around the effect of the OT interventions on functional outcomes. Um, and certainly from our best practice work group, we heard um, a very strong endorsement that OT has a major impact on improving functional status and getting people um, up to um, uh, get them rehabilitated to the point where you want them on a more uh, rapid basis. So I think you need to look at your metrics that you have to support this um, the use of OTs and, and make this an item of specific discussions with the physician groups. But it's an area where 
you probably will continue to see variability based on um, sort of the standards of practice in your community um, and need to make the case through evidence and through metrics. Okay, we're checking to see if there are any more questions. So let's see. We have okay, another great. question clarifying the BCI CJR interface. And right. So this question is around for acute care facilities that are already in the BPCI for Model 2 um, with, with DRG 469 and 470, um, will they trump and continue without an impact on CJR on the Model 2 program? So that's right. Um, again, the if, if an acute care facility um, is it has taken responsibility either in a Model 2, so that's acute care plus post-acute care, or if they're, I don't think many of them are, but if they were doing Model 3 um, for those same two conditions, that is true, the BPCI would, would dominate. Um, and the CJR, those episodes essentially, you know, would be part of the BPCI and not CJR. Okay, I think we're at the end of our questions and almost at the end of our time, so I think we'll wrap up here. Um, I'd like to thank Molly for joining us today and for getting through the 1,100-page regs in record time, um, and we'll continue to be putting out information as we have more time to absorb the policy implications and talk it over with members about how these issues are going to affect you. Um, and on behalf of the clinical side, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us. Again, thank our work group for helping keep this uh, issue of joint replacement in the forefront and developing the blueprint content. Um, so thanks everyone for joining us and uh, we look forward to our next call. Thanks so much, Liza. Bye-bye.